you know, just going to this, uh, you know, this issue of um, wanting to get the therapies to patients when they have the you know, lowest disease burden being true for targeted therapy and immune therapy. You know, Jason, in your practice, um, if you have a patient who's uh, had sequential immunotherapy or it, let's say ipinevo combo, which uh, you know, could only have been patients who were coming off trials mm -hmm. you know, for the most part, um, you know, what, what's your threshold in terms, you know, they have a BRAF mutation, you've got that in your back pocket. Um, you know, how, how much are you willing to, you know, let a little bit of progression on a scan, uh, you know, kind of be followed versus, you know, quick trigger to, to move to, to targeted therapy? BRF, uh, oh, yeah, oh, for the, in the BRF mutant group, yeah. Oh, uh, well, I have a low threshold. Um, uh, there is this phenomenon of pseudo progression with immune checkpoint blocking antibodies, perhaps with ipilimumab, it's 10 to 15 percent. Perhaps it's about the same or maybe less with anti PD1. I think for me, for a patient that's in front of me, I don't really care. <laughs> I want that patient to do well over time. If it turns out that he gets a big, he or she gets a big response, and there was antecedent immune checkpoint blocking antibody, well, six months from now we can then stop the targeted therapies, sure. and if they're then stable, then who cares? Right. So I really have very little. I think the days of like following patients for pseudo progression, uh, I, I'm not excited about doing that particularly. Uh, but I, I think, and the other thing I would throw in is that in a lot of my patients, I use BRAF MEK inhibitor combination therapy as the backup backbone, I know I can always go to it. And so if patients come off of other things, they're gonna go back to it, get this back under control yeah. for a few months, and then we can always think, what else can we try to do? What is another trial that we could try to get them to? Um, and especially in the context of brain metastases. So that is another very powerful strategy, and we didn't touch on this in the context of radiation, but my preference in most BRAF mutant patients who have more than one or two lesions is BRAF MEK inhibitor yeah. as opposed to radiation therapy. Yeah, it's an interesting point. You know, the idea that you actually use drug therapy over any form of radiation therapy in melanoma is kind of a uh, you know unexpected uh, consequence of where we are in the field, but it seems to be true. You know, I, I think this issue about um, you know a lead-in of targeted therapy. Renee, you were talking about that before. You know, maybe uh, you know since you've got a whole portfolio of patients in your practice, and, and many viewers of this program may have just a you know a handful. You know, who are the patients, um, you know, where do you draw the line? Is this just high disease burden symptomatic patients, elevated LDH, I mean, kind of that end of the spectrum where you would think you know, of contemplate switching? that? Yeah, I mean, where you, in other words, where you feel the imperative to start with targeted therapy, but, a, 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 you know, a, a consideration of, of switching. Before, I, I, before the combination, I wasn't particularly uh -huh. enthusiastic about switching because yeah. the response rate to IPI is low. Sure. Um, but again, it gets us that, that long tail to the curve. But with, with the advent of combination immunotherapy, right. it, it's, it's, it's come into my mind more often, you know, should I, should I be switching this patient? And I think my bar is, is falling as, right. to, as to when I do that. Right. Because with, with braf met combination, you know, half the patients will die in about two years. And so I, I'm not worried about the half that go beyond that. Right. But it's right. the, it's the the, the, yeah. the front end of that curve right. that we right. might be able to impact better yeah. now yep. rather than later. Right, right, fair enough. So it, maybe just uh, briefly summarize, since we've seen at this SMR meeting, we've seen some updated data on the vemurafenib and cobimet combination was just approved. Um, you know, how would you uh, you know just quickly score you know response rate, you know, median progression free survival for the the two BRAF MEK combos out there, um, overall survival landmarks. I mean, how do you you know, when you're talking to patients about what, you know, what those therapies can offer, what, you know, what kind of numbers are, are in your mind there? With, uh, in terms of the over, the, the median survival, it's about two years, yeah. 24, 25, 26 months, something yeah. like that. Yeah. The progression-free survival for the single agent uh, BRAF inhibitors is six, seven months in that range. And with the combination, the progression-free survival is uh, a little over a year probably. Right. And so, at two years, you know, half the patients are alive. Right. At three years, it's a somewhat less than that, but still, you know, hopefully those curves will continue to to show that 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 uh, that some of those patients hopefully can be long-term survivors. But it's the rapid progressors once you start that are that are the most problematic, and they tend to be the patients with the most tumor, but not always. Right. And sometimes right. patients with big bulky tumor will have durable. Long, long-term response to years. Right. Sure. But I think those are the patients where you should give an induction regimen of BRAF plus MEK. And I think the data from Jen Wargo and Georgina Long suggests that immunologically speaking, if you're going to give them 
an induction dose or, 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 or regimen. You're only, you should only do it for six to eight weeks because by the time six to eight weeks has elapsed, that initial burst of lymphocytes that get into the tumor as a result of the initial tumor aggression is gone. And my gut tells me that, and it's based on some data, that as you continue to give BRAF plus MEK, especially to the rapid progressors who you know are going to be the ones who do poorly, they're going to be uh, developing not only resistance to BRAF MEK, but they become immune resistant and develop cold tumors. Yeah. So if you're going to take advantage of that, of the data that uh, Jen Wargawit and MD Anderson has shown that giving the BRAF MEK drugs early on gives you that influx of T cells, making a cold tumor into a hot one. I'm thinking of doing six to eight weeks of treatment and then quitting with BRAF MEK and immediately going to probably the combo sure. since this was a patient yes. who had right. aggressive disease in the first place. Right. There's no trial to support that. I'm not sure that there ever will be a trial to support it. Although, it, but I think it's an idea that should be. You just have to note that the current FDA label for the combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab is specifically for BRAF wild type patients. So if you were going to stay on label, you actually probably shouldn't do that just yet. So despite the fact that I think we all agree with what you just said, yeah. that is a caveat. Um, and I guess I'm struck by a couple of comments around some of the things that people have said. So definitely there is a population of patients who stay on BRF mac combination for a long time. Right. And I think from the Combi-V, Combi-D, the Cobrim study, it looks like it's like a third right. of patients that are a couple of years out are right. still on those drugs. And Georgina uh, presented at the SMR conference now, uh, clinical um, right. you know, aspects of patients who go out a long time and really drill down on the point that it's patients who are good performance status and low LDH are the ones that are most likely to be on drug for a long period of time. And that really sort of is something we need to go back and think because we have the this idea that, oh, those patients are the ones that have to get immunotherapy. And I don't know how we're going to select those people yet, but certainly it's something we need to really think back upon. Right. But this idea that uh, you're only going to use those drugs in the BRAF wild type population, I think is shall we say, more honored in the breach than in, in the observance, as Shakespeare would say. Yeah. So yeah, for the right. immunotherapy. Sure. But a lot of docs, including me, are treating mutated patients with uh, the combination regimen. I'm not saying you should do it in place of BRAF MEK, but it is certainly an option that I've taken advantage of. Sure. The other thing that I'll note is there was a, a great paper by uh, Roger Lowe's group with Tony Ribas looking at mechanisms, uh, non-genomic mechanisms of resistance to BRAF MEK targeted therapies. Uh, and that paper clearly showed at least a quarter of the resistance that develops to combination therapy is immunologically driven. It's this concept that uh, whatever the inflammatory infiltrate is lost. Mm. And I think that we've seen that. This, um, if we do on-treatment biopsies after initiation of BRAF inhibitor combination, you see an initial influx of, of CD8 T cells, and that's lost at progression. And so it very well could be that treating all the way to progression actually could kill the immune response. Oh, I would And agree. I think this actually has implications on multiple combinations going forward then, we really probably shouldn't be in a situation of overlapping all of these treatments, right? right? BRAF, MAC, PD-1, c not at all at the same time because it may be that one may actually have detrimental impact on another. And we actually have laboratory data that actually suggests that we may mechanistically be able to figure this out why. That's why I think you should give that brief burst of BRAF, MAC, take advantage of the lack of immunologic resistance and sure. MAP kinase resistance and then quickly move on to the immunotherapy. But will there be a trial to test that? There could be. It could simply be a randomized phase two of, say, dabrafenib plus trametinib continuous therapy versus dabrafenib plus trametinib six weeks, right. stop, IPI plus NEVO. Will that trial happen? I don't know. That's the kind of trial the cooperative groups ought to do, mm. and I, I like the idea. Well, you know, they, they make a cautionary note first, which I think you, you've all you know, touched on. You know, combination targeted therapy, immunotherapy in practice right now, I'd say we all agree really not quite ready for prime time. The, the sequences and, and how close to put the drug, drugs together, when to make the switch, I think that, that's a real world issue. And even absent a clinical trial, I think, you know, we're all, we're all facing, you know, patients where we feel like we, we need to do something to try to optimize their long-term outcome by weaving these therapies uh, or you know, maybe in a regimen that puts them next to the, each other but not overlapping. Uh, this may be